the Tudor's Dynasty Podcast. Welcome back to the show. I'm your host, Rebecca Larson. One of the most popular topics that we cover on the website and the podcast is symbolism in portraiture. So today I am talking to Dr. Emma Cahill Marone and Mel Taylor about the portrayal of parrots in various works of art and sculpture. We'll be exploring the earliest appearance of portrayal of parrots in medieval and early modern works, why these birds were thought to be so special, where they came from, and who was it that supplied the growing demand in Europe in the 15th and 16th centuries. So to start, is there any documentary evidence of trade in exotic birds to Western Europe? And if so, where can they be found? Shall I answer that, Emma? Yes, you should. Okay, right. Well, um, we have evidence going back to three or 400 years BC that uh, the uh, parrots came across to Europe and they uh, were imported by the Egyptians and the Romans and the Greeks. And Alexander was the one who brought uh, uh, the parrot called the Alexandrine parrot into Europe and they just proliferated all over the place. The Romans loved them and they even, they had them as pets. They put them into cages made of precious metal and tortoiseshell and ate them. But so far, I've not yet found a recipe for roast parrot. <laughs> but I have found roast quail, roast flamingo, roast peacock, dating back to Roman times. And it was the Arabs. The Arabs were the ones bringing them in from the right from the Far East and then Moving forward to the medieval times, you've got them in the um, bestiaries, which date from the 11th and 12th centuries. There's a Frederick Barbarossa's book of hunting birds, which and you've been given a silver co uh, crested cockatoo by Sultan. I don't know what where is it. Uh, ooh, Sultan of Babylon, and that's in the Vatican Library, and you can actually go through it page by page. Then there was Pope Martin V, and he had a keeper of parrots at the Vatican. And then we go through books of hours, and they appear in the margins. And books of hours dating from the late 14th century through the 15th century, right the way up to the time of uh, Mary I and Isabella and the Habsburgs. But not only that, the we know that they, Van Eyck had a portrait and um, was commissioned to do an altarpiece, and that was the portrait of Joris van der Peel, who was a canon of a particular church. And there you have the Virgin clutching this ch infant child who is in turn clutching his pet parrot. Now, why was the association of the parrot and Christ and the Virgin and that was because these birds could speak with a human voice and they were believed to speak with the voice of God. And the way that they had been marketed by the exporters was because they had been also been pets of various Buddhist monks and in various Buddhist monasteries. And they had mimicked the chanting of the monks. And that was used as, if you like, um, an advertising technique saying, Look, they can do that, therefore they can speak with divine words. And that's why we have them all in these re religious texts. But they were fascinated. You know, people were fascinated by them. They were expensive. They became a status symbol. Um, they were imported to Henry V, who had his own merchant called Robert Buckman, who imported parrots and salamanders for the royal the royal court. Why would you want to import a member of the Newt family? I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> so the visual evidence, we've got African greys. There's a genealogy roll of 12, 1270 of the he English heptarchy, and that has an African grey on it. There's a genealogy roll um, by um, Simon Benning, and that's got an African grey on it. So African continent and the Far East, as far as the Spice Islands, and the cockatoo might even have come from Australia. It appears in 1496 on an altarpiece, now in the Louvre, but by the Italian artist Andrea Mantegna. And 
that was painted two years before Columbus got to the Caribbean. And wow. once that happens, that opens up the new world. And now over to you, Emma, what happens after that? Well, I'm just blown away. Uh, before you all, you all go and buy a parrot, they live up to 100 years sometimes. <laughs> They're highly demanding creatures as pets. So, you know, I know it's very exciting to think that you can, oh, yeah, parrots are great, but <laughs> wow. That's um, commitment. Yes, it would be. It, I, I read a lot about these um, recently um, preparing for this, and they're, they are fascinating, but they are also, I think the gray parrots are the ones that can mimic human voice the best. Uh, mm -hmm. So that's why they are highly valued. But then to me, uh, I think because I'm a very visual person, uh, the colors, obviously, I think are very attractive. <laughs> and, and and Melanie, you told me about how they also appear um, as in the angel wings of manuscripts, right? Yes. And that um, I have a theory, but I can't I can't actually prove it. Certainly we see in the Portinari Altafi, uh, which is Hugo mm -hmm. van der Goes, and that's in the Uffizi, if anybody wants to is in Florence and wants to go and see it. And you've got the four archangels, and they have very distinct wings. And they're mm. obviously painted from birds that Hugo van der Goes. Now, whether those birds were alive or whether they came stuffed, probably mm. with straw, um, is unknown. But certainly, I think it's uh, Raphael, who was the archangel who also supported music. He's got the most beautiful multicolored wings. But that's before we get to the new world where you mm -hmm. get multicolored, um, you know, hyacinth and different versions of the macaw. So where were they coming from? I have well, no idea. I think I have a slight idea. Maybe I can share with you. <laughs> right. So it um doing um this um parrot thing, I think Rebecca might remember in a last time we spoke that a monk certain monkey came up in the conversation. <laughs> Uh, yes. In relation to Queen Catherine of Aragon and her betrayal with uh, an American monkey, and uh, Rebecca was very surprised to learn he was American. Um, and and you know, it, thinking about that and how and that it is fascinating, not to think that an American monkey is being betrayed with a Queen of England who is from originally from Spain in a little miniature done in England by a Flemish artist. Mm. Wow, that's a lot of um, things there, but that's that's a reality. And like Melanie was saying, it was a status symbol. So that monkey, and then now the parrots that we're going to talk about are that status symbol. In the case of Catherine of Aragon, she's also not only linked to monkeys, but parrots, because in the court of, of, of Isabella and Ferdinand, there was a lot of these parrots coming from Portugal. Um, as you know, the Portuguese had uh, uh, were very good sailors. Obviously, their ge geographical position on the Mediter on the Atlantic obviously gave them that advantage. But also, they had been doing lots of incursions in Africa throughout, um, trying to get that passageway into into Asia. When in um, when the in, in Castile, they decided, well, we we want to do this too. And there was also all these alliances going on. So there was a lot of um, trading these new things. So the, the the Castilians learned quickly, and they and they wanted these things that were coming from from the court of Portugal. And and let's remember that Isabel of Castile was her mother was Portuguese, and she grew up with her mother. Not she didn't grow up in the court of Henry the Fourth. She grew up in Arevalo with her mother in a Portuguese court. We know by fifth uh, fourteen eighty eight in her accounts there is. Um, uh, a mention to the to the uh, first parrots that are coming from Portugal. So this is 1488. This is before they go to Brazil. So these parrots have to come from somewhere else. Melanie, we can maybe t tell us about that. But the yeah, are they are these are they described? Because in the inventories that we have here, it just says parrots. Or in the parrots. Spanish word, in this case, is papagayos. Right, and in the Scottish, it's the papingo. And in German, it's papagai. So this is a word for parrot in many languages. It doesn't specifically say. It just says uh, una jaula, so a cage, for, para los papagayos, for the right. parrots, from Portugal. So we know they, they're coming from Portugal. Um, uh, but the, the interesting thing is, in these expenses, that talking about this uh, cage for the parrots, 
there are expenses put for the marriage facilities when um, her, the eldest daughter of Isabel and Fernando Isabella, named after her mother, marries a Portuguese infante, and they have a wedding, a wedding celebration by proxy in Seville where there's representations of pharaohs paid by the Prince of Spain, by John of Spain, by Isabella's son, when these parrots are mentioned. So, um, and we know in the marriage festivities in Portugal, there was a lot of presence of all the conquest of Henry, uh, of, of the previous Portuguese kings that were expanding this idea. I think this is where Isabella and Fernando got the idea to, you know, fund Columbus, but well, more Isabella than Fernando. So I think this is the direct link between that idea of like, these guys are doing these great things traveling and look at these amazing birds and they start incorporating them. Because then later in 1518, one of um, Catherine of Aragon's former servants sends her a letter from Santo Domingo. I think this is probably the first letter that we know that someone sending from America to an English queen. And he says to her that he wants to send, he wants to come to England to serve her because he doesn't want to be in Santo Domingo anymore. He's heard about the great things she's doing in England. He wants to come and serve her. And he says, I would send you parrots, but I'm afraid they're going to die if I send them with this English friar that's here that's going to take you this letter. So I'll come myself and I'll bring them to you myself. But he does send her a cathique chair and a cathique gown to show her how the cathique women, the women in, in the elite in the in the um in 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 the caribbean uh before the the spanish arrived how they dressed the where the chair that they sat on because he said because these people behave like kings and queens i want to show you what they dress like i'm sure that probably that gown had some um feathers what do you think melanie maybe um i know that there is in a well there is in a collection which was done for the Habsburgs, where the the, the local, the indigenous people of Portugal, uh, of the Portuguese Brazil area, um, probably around Port Seguro, which is where um, the they first made landfall in Brazil, or the Portuguese mm -hmm. made landfall in Brazil, and they are wearing capes of of multicolored feathers. But earlier than that, would these courts, these royal courts, have owned a copy of Marco Polo's adventures? Mm. because he does he ha there's one literally a single sentence where he describes the parrots and he said there are red ones and there are many colored ones mm -hmm. and there are very tiny ones which i think probably inspired or the stories of them inspired the illuminators to give the wings different colors mm -hmm. i mean i've there are various um illuminations where there's rows and rows of angels and they've got blue ring wings or red wings or green wings and occasionally white wings and if you think of budgerigars native budgerigars i mean there's so many colors now but basically they are blue green and occasionally white ones and they're tiny and they chatter a lot and you can also teach them how to speak i used to have budgerigars when i was a child <laughs> Peter and Squeak, <laughs> and they they love to be in in flocks, and I just wondered. That's the only description I have found of the you know coloured birds, except for some recent archaeological excavations, which come from Roman times, and they are multicoloured. There's a multicoloured mosaic at a place called Santa Poche, which is near Seville. You know oh. it. Ever. I, I definitely know Seville. It's a beautiful city if you're looking. I mean, I know everybody's going to Spain this year for their holiday. So put <laughs> Seville in your list because it's amazing. That's where that wedding that I was telling you about was in the Reales Alcázares in Seville, uh, which are of, um, they are from the Islamic period uh, and they are absolutely wonderful. But I think what you're referring to is previous Roman that would be probably outside of Seville. And Seville was Ispalis, it was, it was it's a very, very old city. So yes, it, it had a Roman um, um, enclave before it, it was, it was uh, so I, yeah. And there's a, in the South of Spain too, we have to think that many cultures were there. The Greeks were there, the Carthaginians were there, the Romans were there. So there's a lot of, what I was thinking when you were mentioning Marco Polo is like, 
I know that Isabel of Castel had one of the biggest libraries in Europe. So I'm sure she did have that. She must have had had that. But this this archaeological dig has got the green parrots. Mm -hmm. You know, the, I'm the sure they would have found things. And they were excavating but, and doing there was people interested in archaeology in her reign because there was a lot of humanists. So Oh, this is have... this is more recent. This is within the last 20, 30 years. And they've discovered this Roman villa. And in it, they've got it, it's the room of the parrots, and the the floor is designed divided up, and it's got peacocks, and it's got all sorts of interesting stuff. But it has two parrots, a green one and a multicolored one. Now we know that couldn't have come from the New World unless somebody's going to discover that the, the ancient Greeks and the ancient Romans had got across the Atlantic. But the only other place where multicolored birds come from of this nature is Northern Australia. And that's the hmm. lorikeets, the rainbow lorikeets. So my question is, can't prove it at all. Were the Arabs actually trading with the Australian First Nation people mm -hmm. um, and bringing budgerigars, because they're native to Australia, and these rainbow lorikeets and selling them on, and suddenly you get the Europeans buying them in the Levant and the Venetian traders and the Castilians and the Portuguese and the English saying, oh, we want those. We can sell these in England. We can sell them in Portugal. And what's more, people will pay huge amounts of money for them. And they're tastier than salamanders. <laughs> <laughs> Rebecca, have you ever had a salamander? Um, a <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> I'd say the, the most exotic thing I've probably had that would seem odd to some people would be like squirrel and rabbit, maybe. <laughs> oh, okay. Rabbit, yes. Squirrel, no. It, it tastes rabbit. like... Was what does squirrel taste like? Like chicken. <laughs> oh! I mean, rabbit is pretty pretty popular in Spain. They, we put a lot with rice, so I mean, you oh. know, if it's if it's tasty, you can cook it. <laughs> and you should because you know yeah well i'm i'm i think you know i've never thought so much about parrots as i've done in the last few days um <laughs> because of of the um question that came, uh, arose about the monkey rebecca got me thinking about monkeys and and exotic animals and 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 especially trying to always find and um, probably anyone who knows a bit about my work knows that I talk a lot about this. I'm trying to find things that I can trace back to Catherine of Aragon's uh, influence. But because a lot of the documents around her were destroyed, I have to find it through different avenues. And one of the most important ones, obviously, is all the things that are coming into England from Spain during the time that she's influential. And it's people, it's uh, a lot of uh, new types of goods and we've talked i've talked before about the fashion and all that but today i wanted to talk about a very important document that i found in a in a book of of, of travelers of english travelers of the english nation it says and there's a very interesting uh, three or four documents i mean all the book is very interesting but in this case this specific document talks about someone who's doing a summary on the on the books of of merchants that have been, uh, that were traveling between England and the Levant through the Portuguese during the time of the reign of Catherine of Aragon and Henry VIII. And I want to specifically say Catherine of Aragon and Henry VIII because it stops before, uh, it doesn't go through all the reign of Henry VIII and we'll talk about why, right? So it, the document is is very interesting, and it and it starts saying that in the year of our Lord of fifteen eleven or fifteen twelve. So let's think about that, right? Mm. That's that's about two years into their reign. Yeah, and she's still very influential um, because Catherine of Aragon's influence on Henry doesn't decline until a bit after that. Until basically she she um, kills it as as being regent, and he's. He can't take it anymore. So he decides that Woolsey is a better companion. And it goes until 1534. And we'll talk about that, right? And he talks about all these ships that have been going to Levant from Bristol, from Southampton, he gives names of the people. But then he talks about what they're bringing and the places they've been. And they, and this is it's titled Levant, but they, they give places like Sicily, like Cyprus, like Tripoli, like Syria. 
and the commodities uh, and at uh, cottons and and a lot it doesn't mention parrots per se i must say but it does mention a lot of things and this is just uh a neck i think this is just a summary of those books so someone who's really interested could go in there and find more things about it but it talks about the people and it says that the english merchants were um uh, trading with jews turks and other foreigners so um, emma um our, tr our our links of portugal of course go back to the time of john of gaunt mm -hmm, mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. you know i can i can well see that 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 close trading link mm -hmm. um with portugal because my research into stuff later also has close links with portugal Mm -hmm. um, and particularly when Philip II becomes king, mm. and, and that's what was it? That's fifteen eighty two. Is it that he mm -hmm. becomes king of Portugal? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, Maybe a lot but, of people don't know that, but that's a, that's a reality. Uh, Philip yeah. the second of Spain became king of Portugal due to this these marriage alliances that Isabella and Fernand Fernand did. Um, their idea ultimately was to unite all the kingdoms of the Iberian Peninsula in under one monarch, and this became a reality during Philip II's reign. Um, well, it's you know that that whole that whole un unification of the of the Iberian Peninsula mm -hmm. really does affect our trade, not only then when when Catherine was very influential, mm -hmm. but also much later when Mary, of course, is is queen. But what I'm I'm interested in is when you say that Catherine's influence declines in the 1510s after after Flodden, basically. Mm, yes. Is that with the rise of Wolsey? Yes, exactly. And she she knew how people like Wolsey were, so she was always polite, courteous. She tried to be nice to him, and she did all the things to to win him over. But he just had to push her away because he had to be number one. So and then Henry um just decided that was the way because I think uh because of the problems they were having to have a boy, I think mm. that ended up having an effect on both of them. I mean, you can't be happy when that's happening to you, right? That no. has to have an impact on your especially when there's pressure like that to have a boy or um and then you end up having a girl, which is not the ideal situation, uh, especially not in a place where a woman has never reigned. So I think this this is all used by Wolsey, who by the end, when at the end of his life, he does regret uh, mistreating Catherine because she really, really was very good at trying to win enemies over, and um, even her enemies respected her. So, but but I think in this case, it was just Henry got tired of waiting for that for that boy, and just kind of like started. Um, she was very capable in other things, but that's not what he wanted her for. He wanted her for having a boy for having a, mm. an heir right um right. and i think she, she she started to be annoying to him too because obviously if someone if your spouse is doing things better than you but you're supposed to be the king you end up getting annoyed right you so i leave for six months and you almost conquer scotland and i had to stop you because you know uh things like that i think that was one of the problems and this is very clear that he when he has all this shift and he wants to marry Anne Boleyn and all of this. And I'm always fascinated by the fact that they see Catherine as someone very um, boring and that during her time, the Tudor court was very boring because she was always um, basically praying and this and that. But she was the one who, to facilitate all the arrival of these goods, these parrots, these things, these monkeys, these amazing fabrics from everywhere until... Henry decides to go through and marry Anne Boleyn anyway. And this is when in 1531, that those ships that come in England, uh, English ships that come with the Portuguese from Levant are stopped by the King of Portugal, who says, no, you're not going to England because now we're going to seize all of Is he surprised about that? Uh-huh. Yeah, is he, is he surprised? Is he surprised that his actions have stopped trade? I think we can share the letter that he wrote to the King King John the Third of Portugal that Henry the Eighth wrote to him, and people can judge for themselves. He's pleading like a little boy, because this is very important not just to him, but to very influential people in his reign. And this is really, if you don't get all this luxury, you're not going to be a European court that is 
valued in, you know, when you're competing against Francis I or people like that. So I think it's like a tension moment where he realizes that he's losing more than just a wife. He's losing an alliance that had been very profitable for him and that she's so powerful that, that despite that she's, you know, locked away, she can still influence that because people respect her. Because what Catherine had above all was more uh, the respect of people. She didn't have power because Henry had the power, but she had the respect of mm -hmm. people. And that is a type of power, I think. You both nodding, so yeah, <laughs> I yeah. think we're in agreement <laughs> here. I do. So I think we can we can share that that letter um, if, if people want to read it, for sure. Most definitely. And Emma, you touched base a little bit about parrots at the English court as we're talking about Catherine of Aragon and Henry VIII. I'm going to go off script a little bit here and ask you what examples we have of parrots at the English court. Oh, so we have the example that we I told you about this, this former secretary of Catherine of Aragon um, writing to her uh, saying, I want to come and serve you. I, I would have sent parrots, but I'm just worried this friar from England is not, he's already, he wants to get out of there. It, the, the weather doesn't agree with him, right? I'm like, I can understand this man because <laughs> so if it's very I. hot. <laughs> <laughs> if he's very hot, and pale, if it's very hot and he's very pale, I get it. <laughs> <laughs> but on the other hand, I think this this guy was really trying to, to go to England. I think he did eventually. I don't have proof of that, but I do have proof that there was a portrait painted of Mary Tudor of, of Catherine and Henry's uh, little girl, because this is this appears in an inventory of Margaret of Austria in her palace in 1524. Let's remember that Mary Tudor was born in 1516. So if we do the math, she wasn't very old in this uh, painting. This painting is not next to the painting of her mom or her dad or her grandfather. And Margaret had paintings of these people too but it was next to a portrait of Charles V. And why is that? Because in 1524, Mary Tudor is betrothed to Charles uh, V, uh, Holy Roman Emperor, King of Spain, most powerful man on earth, right? Um, and she's represented holding a parrot in her right hand. So obviously I wanted to find this portrait. First thing I did was Google, you know, um, to see if I could find, and I found a lot of not a lot but many paintings around the time of very important women with parrots in their right hand like <laughs> Marguerite d'Angoulême by Jean Clouet that, that's in Liverpool you can you can check that out we'll we'll share it in the notes and she's holding the parrot she was a sister of Francis of, she looks a lot like Francis I too if you and this is a really uh dashing uh portrait too I love the dress it's it's blue when you see the the images you'll 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 realize this is a very very nice portrait. And then there's I found other ones like one in in the Kunsthistorisches Museum, and this is an an unidentified lady. Um, I am not very trained in in German fashion. I think she's wearing German fashion, and the first thing I thought was like, oh, Anne of Cleves. But obviously, yeah. I don't know if it. You yeah. know, I'm not an expert in Anne of Cleves by any means. But I thought, well, another woman, and she looks like she's wearing German attire, but she also has a parrot. Um, and it's around the same time that Mary Tudor's portrait appears in the collection of Margaret um, of Austria. It couldn't have been painted before 1516 because that's when Mary Tudor was born. So it was painted around that time between 1516 and 20, 1524 when it appears in her inventory. Um, but then I found other examples, later examples. Um, and in the Spanish court, Monkeys and parrots are very important. We have a wonderful depiction of the daughters of Philip II, Isabel Clara Eugenia and Catalina Micaela. And if you ever want to know anything about these two sisters uh, in Arte Poder y Genero, where I work, we have, uh, there's a student who's, who's specializing in this and he's found amazing stuff. So if you ever need help on, on these two infantas, that comes to us, Arte Poder y Genero. Um, so, and, and they, they have a, a parrot, uh, and this is in the Royal Collection Trust. So, and, and please go and look at this portrait. It's amazing. There's a similar portrait by, of the two sisters in the Prado, but they don't have a parrot. So sometimes a parrot, so why are they, Melanie, maybe you could help me with this. Why do you think they're sometimes depicted and sometimes not? In well, the one, which, in the the, one the, with the, the three infantas and the parrot, they have a dog as well as a parrot. 
No, I th I think that may well be may have a double double meaning. It it's not only is it a case of that these are in fact royal girls, uh, and of course they are there to. This gets rather arcane, but they they are going to obviously be married off at some point, and therefore they are going to have to be setting the standard of behavior and morality and ethics to the women of the nation that they're married into, and. The, if they if they have parrots on their right hand, of course the right hand is uh, dextra, and this is sinister because sinister, you know, the left hand is supposed to be slightly mm, um, underhand and not, um, I would say, kosher, but that's not not a Christian value. <laughs> um, uh, but you know, the fact that you sit on the right hand of God. And if you go back to that Van Eyck altarpiece of, you know, Canon van der Pale, and he's on his knees and the, you've got the Virgin, she has the Christ child on her right hand and he is holding his pet parrot with his right hand. And so that they are reflecting her status. Uh, the, If you like, the princesses will be reflecting um, the Virgin Mary's status as the guider of the children of any marriage that happened, and also to set the standards of, of behavior within whichever court it is, so that other women will reflect that and look look to them as their um, role models. I know that sounds a bit obtuse, but then again, they didn't have Wikipedia or, or the internet and everything. So the philosophies that came through was visual. And so that they would have immediately recognized that, 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 that it's the right hand and it's the right hand, which is the important one. And the majority of people write with their right hand or they, you know, it's they eat with their left, their right hand. And even in different faiths, you know, it's the right hand, which is important. I know. I know. Because when I was going to school, I'm left handed. And when I was going to Me school. Too. <laughs> I'm ambidextrous. I, I, oh, good for you. I'm so left handed. Um, <laughs> it's ridiculous. And I remember when I was a kid, and this is going to sound like I'm very old person, which I'm, I'm getting up there. I'm the eldest um, kid. <laughs> <laughs> I remember sometimes certain teachers saying, Yeah, don't prefer to use your other hand. And no, <laughs> why would I want to use my other hand? But this is funny because Melanie, l listen to this in the in the portrait, the double portrait of Isabella Clarugenia and Catalina Micaela. Isabella Clarugenia is holding it in her left hand. There is some reason for that. There is some reason. But I think it might be. I don't know. I'm going to throw this in here. She was very important. She was the heiress, and you know, in the Spanish monarchy is a bit different. Women are accounted for and taken yep. into consideration in the succession. So this might be like a way to represent her differently so they know she's different she's not just a woman she's a certain type of woman it, that could well be it i mean it's it's an area which is growing i mean the 19th century antiquarians bless them they they <laughs> didn't actually look at an awful lot of the actual deeper um symbolism or the, the deeper uses of of numbers or images or items or anything like that we all know about you know blue for the virgin's robe and the red for symbols of sacrifice green for hope white for faith hence the italian and the portuguese flags mm -hmm. red white and green mm -hmm. um and most most people nowadays would go, oh yes, the Portuguese flag and the Italian flag, red, white, and green, and not give it a moment's thought. But it was very very important, especially if you were a ship's captain. Um, can I just go back to the parrots and the numbers that might have been imported? Please. I have a lovely book called Venice and the East by a woman called Deborah Howard. Um, yes, Howard, and it's published by Paul Mellon Centre for British Art. And she she found that that they there was a Venetian captain who had sailed from somewhere. I think it might have been Haifa or or you know one of the ports, and what is was then Palestine. And unfortunately, he died en route. And this merchant, you know, his captain said, "Well, what do we do with the parrot?" 
well we've got enough sunflower <laughs> seeds you know so we'll and everything like that we we'll, we can feed the parrot but what do we do when we get get to venice do we sell it because we know we can make a massive profit on it and it, it, it they do do the good thing here they actually do abide by the, the rules of what we as we would see them that it needs to go to the family because clearly the now deceased merchant was bringing it back for the very same reason that it's a one-off item and he knows that it's going to command a king's ransom or mm -hmm. an emperor's ransom even but what we don't know is what sort of parrot it was had mm -hmm. it come up from mm -hmm. africa had it been a ring neck parakeet had it been one of the more exotic ones from those secret places which the Arabs wouldn't talk about, yeah. i.e. you know, sulfur crested cockatoo or even a multicoloured one. Okay. We just don't know. But their value comes in the fact that there are very few of them. I, so I have to jump in here a little bit because we're talking about symbolism and you're talking about which hand they were holding the birds in in their portraits. We've talked about the symbolism of colors. And I'm curious, did different parrots have different symbolism? Good question. No idea. <laughs> I love if that they answer. Could talk, yes, probably. <laughs> yes. I want to bring up something because you were talking and this light bulb just went. Sir Henry Guilford, one of Catherine of Aragon's closest allies, went to Jerusalem. Yes. And he will, he fought in the War of Granada. Ah. He was made a knight in Burgos by Ferdinand of Aragon. So, I mean, he could have brought, I mean, he most probably brought many things when he came back from that. There was, there's a lot of um, safe conducts to knights for fighting in the War of Granada. Uh, I found one yet um, a few days ago, uh, and and when they say they're English, that's when it, I I go deeper. But in this case, this this guy that I found two days ago, he was from Limerick, so he wasn't English; he was Irish. But uh, I think they were just like, oh yeah, up there, right, English. <laughs> so, but what I'm trying to say is, is I think these were coming from many people, and people like Sir Henry Guilford, if he went all the way to Jerusalem, we know that a lot of people were trading there too, and I'm sure he brought things back. Um, so I think there was a lot more movement because the alliance was established with the Spaniard, Spaniards and with that extended to the Portuguese, and this is when the letter of Henry pleading to the Portuguese king will see that, um, this is easier. People are coming and going a lot more. All these merchants are going back and forth. And the the other thing, when when the man uh, sends a letter to Catherine of Aragon from Santo Domingo, he mentions an English ambassador he had spoken to. Well, he hadn't left America for years. So it was that English ambassador there. Because I don't think they had cell phones back in 1518 so, <laughs> or the internet. So, you know, this is where I pull all these little strings uh, that are so interesting. Um, and, and I, you know, it's it's so interesting to see when you follow the, the really the money, because parrots represent power and money, right? The, you you have status, you have power. You, and, and when you follow the money, you find all these in, in, intriguing connections, you know? And parrots are linked to this luxury trade that in in the case of the of the court of portugal during the time that catherine of aragon was queen we know it was her niece catherine of austria the queen of portugal who was sending a lot of these exotic things to her re female relatives mostly i have not found yet the direct link between catherine and her niece if you do find it please 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 send it over because i think it's just a matter of time now that we know about this something will appear you know, there's it'll, a lot of appear in, in a in a probate inventory, but it won't be described. It'll just have parrot, right? Or maybe even hummingbirds, because we know from um, research by a lovely lady called Heather Dalton that from Bristol they were going across to the New mm. World, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. they tried to bring back hummingbirds, but mm. of course they didn't know how to feed them, and they died. And he was de this particular um, merchant was determined that his his exotic gift to, I think it was Henry the Seventh, but it was certainly at the beginning of the 16th century. Um, so he gutted them and stuffed them with straw. 
so that he could produce these tiny jewel-like birds um, as a sort of look what amazing things you know paradise that we've discovered by sailing west and it's mm. not it, it's the global expansion which i find so amazing and that it is it is it is it um documented um the hacklet society um richard hacklet in the 16th century i've looked at the stuff where the portuguese documents have been um translated but I've not discovered the one which you sent me the other day, which is about the English aspects of it. And I found that really fascinating. And I've been wading my way through that book. And the, the spelling's quite interesting. <laughs> Isn't it always? Yes. Now I'm yeah. starting to think about Catherine Varagon's parrot. And did it, did it speak Spanish? Probably. Do you think it, she would have trained the parrot to say things to her rivals when they got there in Spanish, maybe? I don't know. That would be funny to think about. <laughs> Well, they'd have understood Latin, so if she'd actually maybe oh, yeah. she told them to say rude things in Spanish, which they didn't understand. <laughs> yeah, who knows? I mean, I know that she used, you know, she she knew several languages, so she used that to her advantage. She when um, Wolsey came to see her once with Campeggio, he tried to address her in Latin, and she said, "Stop there." These people who are my witnesses need to hear this, and not all of them speak Latin, so please address me in English. So oh, uh, she, right. she, yeah, she used her, the languages she knew, and Henry VIII learned Spanish. They had Spanish grammar books, and we know Mary Tudor uh, spoke Spanish, so I, I'm sure the parrot spoke Spanish too. And oh, I, yeah. I just well, can't get it out of my head. <laughs> <laughs> well, just before, just before um, we we hopped on here. I found something that um, on a on a website where it said that Henry had an African grey, and oh. that spoke English. Oh, and it was kept at Hampton Court, and apparently it amused itself by calling the boatman from across the water, across the River Thames, to come across. And of course, when they arrived, there was nobody there. It was the parrot had sort of said, "Come and get me." And so the people <laughs> at Hampton Court had to pay the boatman for a totally unnecessary trip, which now uh, did these parrots have senses of humor? I mean, <laughs> well, I did read their, yeah, I did read they're, ex yeah, I did read they're very, very intelligent animals, right? Yeah. But as you say, don't rush out and buy one. They live a long time. <laughs> um, up to a hundred years. Uh, yes. Wow. Yes. Um, one of the things which I was quite fascinated by is the, these numbers of portraits of women outside the 16th century that have parrots. I mean, mm -hmm. right the way up to Victoria. And, yes. you know, this is... but are they always associated with royalty? I don't think it's always royalty. I think it's money, power and status because the oh, duchesses yeah. and... Uh, and for, let's think about Italy. They don't have um, kings, and uh, so they have duchesses and other types of. So it's not always royalty. I think it's the high nobility too, probably. And power. And it's, yeah, power. Um, and it's very interesting. For example, I thought it was fascinating when I found a parrot in one of the the paintings that uh, Queen Anne of Denmark bought. Uh, that was in um, the Meisers, which is a copy of a very famous. Uh, painting that um so there's there's certain appeal to the parrots um because i think they just automatically would give that image already in the 17th century of oh this is this is a painting that is it's got symbolism these these queens in the 17th century already have that kind of she's probably seen portraits of women with parrots and this and that and um, i'm not saying she bought it because of the parrot but the parrot is there so I, it, it probably was an appealing element to have something like exotic like that. And then when I was doing more research for this epi episode, I found out that, like you said, Queen Victoria commissioned several paintings of her favorite parrots. And sometimes in in um, with her other pets, but there's one of her favorite parrot. And I mean, no wonder she she... She commissioned a painting of this animal because it's so beautiful. Uh, we'll Is that the red lorry keep? The red lorry. Uh, let me. Ch you're the expert in the all the species of parrots. Uh, you I'm can't sorry. miss it. It's bright red. <laughs> yes, yeah, the bright red one. Isn't he wonderful? That's by Edward Lancia. I've I've, I've put a, 
I printed them all off and put them in a safe place and now I can't find them. <laughs> Oops, no, I've got it. them right here. Uh, and the one, the one, uh, and she commissioned this one to give it to the Duchess of Kent. So again, women, women, I'm very intrigued by what, so why they appear so much in female portraiture. Maybe because I'm obsessed with um, gender. I think it goes sense. back to that Van Eyck original mm -hmm. altarpiece where you've got the Virgin and the child and the word of God coming through. And I think that's that has a lot to do with it. I and why right. why they also appear in the margins of various books of ours and mm -hmm. um, other religious texts as well. Well, I but, wanted to uh, ask you about that, about that wonderful manuscript that you've studied Um were there some parrots belonging to a very special lady that is very close to my heart. Um, can you tell us more about that? <laughs> ah, yes. Now, years ago, I was looking at um, the Cramp Ring Manuscript, which is in Westminster. Well, it belongs to Westminster Cathedral, but it is one of, the, one of their treasures. But um, it also has been on display in Westminster Abbey. And it used to be kept in the monument room there. And when I was looking at the work of Lavina Tierling, who was, in fact, I believe, a cousin of Susanna Horenboot, there was very, very close links. And I know that the two workshops collaborated, and we can see that through the uh, various images. And after Lucas Horenboot had died, Henry needed to have um, an illuminator he got William Scrotts, he poached her from Margaret of Austria uh, to replace Holbein, who died. And so, you know, how do I get an illuminator? Anyway, Lavina Tierling, who is the daughter of the great Simon Benning, is recruited. And she goes on to serve Henry, Edward, Mary and Elizabeth. She's there for the better part of 30 years. And she arrives in 1545. So... When Mary the First comes along, she changes her styles for each monarch. She and she, the first thing that Mary does is reinstate the cramp ring um, service, which is the blessing of the cramp rings and the laying on of hands by the monarch to cure the king's evil. And only the kings of France and England can do this. And it goes back to time of Edward the Confessor. In that, in that manuscript, there are three full page illuminations, but it's not the subject of the, of the central illuminations. It was the man, round about the marginalia, which I thought was fantastic. And it was some years, and in fact, it was 10 years after I'd actually looked at this, this particular document and I'd been looking at the central part. I suddenly realized that there was a blue and gold liqueur sitting in the margin. And it'd been sitting right there, hidden in plain sight in front of me. And I don't know, because these parrots are not described in the documents. Was this one of Catherine's parrots? Was it that parrot in the portrait that is in the portrait that's now lost that hung in Malin? Mm -hmm. And it was still there at the time when she became queen and was married to Philip II. And we know that this document was created um, for when she was married for, to Philip II because their united um, coats of arms are at the very front of it. And there is this wonderful parrot just sitting there looking wonderful. Unfortunately, nobody seems to have sort of cottoned on to this. But my big question at the time when I discovered it was, why is it there? Because it's on the same page as where she's touching this poor infected victim who's got these terrible nodules on his neck. And she's emphasised the Queen's hands by making them slightly larger so that you can see it's the royal touch that's going to cure him. And it's only through her and her royal status and the fact that she's God, God's representative on Earth but who is it who speaks the word of God? It's her parrot. Mm. So there's this curious link that goes all the way through, which is why I wondered whether or not this whole idea of royal women and or powerful women, because if you think of the duchesses, they were the ruling families in Italy. They were the ones who ruled their duchies. 
So it's them that has the power and therefore they're the ones who have this close link with the divine. But I must admit, I think Mary's, Mary's hidden parrot, and it's the only evidence that we have that we had um, parrots from the New World actually in England in the 16th century, which is, we know that Henry had this African grey parrot, which annoyed the boatman down at the River Thames. <laughs> <laughs> but this one we know was sitting in Westminster Abbey um, in, in a document, but was it also sitting and going around with Mary's court? Perhaps it probably was. Mm. Over to you, Emma. I'm blown away. <laughs> I love that. I could hear you speak all day because that's just incredible. And the fact that you said that the coat of arms is joined with uh, with uh, Phillips. I mean, she, maybe we forget that she was queen of Spain at that time. She was not only queen of England, but she was queen of Spain. So that could represent, that could be a Spanish element in there. It's 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 adding another layer and another layer of, of evidence that there is this Habsburg Spanish link. And Spanish speaking this, Habsburg parrot. Oh my goodness. This is yeah. a rabbit hole, Rebecca. What did you do to us? <laughs> <laughs> this is the rabbit hole. Everybody need it. <laughs> I, I love this, you guys. And you know, we've been at this now for almost an hour. I know. <laughs> and I, you know, one of the things that I just realized, we didn't really have much time to talk about another topic that I would like to bring in. And I think this should be our next episode together, the three of us. And I don't want to talk about it today, but I want to bring it up is not only were parrots used um, in portraiture, but other exotic animals were as well. And I really want to talk to you guys about this in the future. We're not going to talk about it today, but before we go, I want <laughs> to give each of you, I don't know, let's say 30 seconds. I'm not timing you. So <laughs> I give you 30 seconds to put in any final words that you want to talk to the listeners about when it comes to parrots. Why don't we start with Emma? Okay. Oh, I, well, I want to thank Melanie and I want to thank Rebecca. First of all, Rebecca, for making me think about parrots. Um, and then Melanie, because, you know, somebody just plants a little seed in your head like Rebecca did. And then somebody just, just throws a bucket of water and that just grows because Melanie, you blow me away with your knowledge of parrots. All I want to do know, I know I will never know as much as you do about parrots, but I'm so interested in them now. I want to learn everything. I was actually learning all. I'm like, it's it's not an easy topic either. So it's an, it's an interesting hobby to take on. So if you guys are looking for a New Year's resolution, maybe parrots is your new thing. And I would like to ask anyone that does find a portrait of a little girl with a parrot that looks a little bit like a could be a Tudor princess, please send it over to me because I'd be more than happy to find that portrait of Mary Tudor if we still have it. Thank you, Emma. Thank you. How about well, you, Mal? Right. Well, um, I, I just, you know, going back to my buttery girls, I just love, love my feathered friends. Um, and this all started because somebody who has a parrot actually got contacted me and said, I know that I think this is an Alexandrine parrot and it comes I th or a, a parrot that comes from northern Australia. And this prayer book comes from the 13, 13, late 1300s, but I can't find trading records with Australia. And then I realized that Australia wasn't discovered until the eight, late 18th century. But there had to have been, I mean, this woman knows her parrots. And I thought, wow, we're onto something here. And that kicked the whole thing off and took me <laughs> down the Arab trading routes and into the silk routes and the maritime silk routes and some of the maritime archaeology. And and it's been a fascinating journey, but it's not just been parrots. It's been Komodo dragons and it's been oh. monkeys and it's been sugar and rice and... That's a whole new subject, but Rebecca, thank you for giving me the opportunity. And Emma, I just love talking to you. I think it's great because there's so much to find out about parrots in the 16th century and earlier. And <laughs> thank you so much to the both of you for joining me today on this episode of the Tudors Dynasty podcast. We'll be back again in the future with another episode, let's say on other exotic animals and portraiture. The Tudor's Dynasty Podcast.